Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Holland, Texas. We're glad to see each and every one of you here. Those of you joined us by Facebook Live, thank you for joining us as well. If you are our guest this morning, right in the back of the seat in front of you, there is a guest information card. If you'll do one of two things for us, either deposit those cards in the offering plates that are standing here at the front and at the back, or you can place one of the cards during the offering period of time when the deacons are passing the plates around, all right? So we're glad to start the service off this morning with the ordinance of baptism. We call it an ordinance because that's exactly what it is. And that's this morning we want to start off by introducing you to Gunnar Quicksale, who also, Quicksaw, said that wrong, uh, pardon that, who also accepted Christ this summer during one of the summer camps. Got her coming down. There you go. All right, y'all say hello to Gunner. All right, Gunner, say hello back. Yeah, Gunner is right here. Gunner, is it your testimony? That you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Yes, it is indeed his testimony. And so because of what your profession of faith in him, in Jesus Christ is, it's my privilege to baptize you, my little brother in Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay. There we go. All right. Buried with Christ in baptism, Gunner is raised to walk in newness of life. Now we've got a couple more baptismal candidates for you as Thomas comes to baptize two more people. Stand and sing. 
repented of my sin, the one of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and brought me with His redeeming love. He loved me and I knew Him and all my love.
is our offertory time, and as the ushers come forward, let's sing Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless? grace the god of ages step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Cause Jesus, yours is the
Let's give them a hand. Thank you to our praise team for helping us this morning. You may be seated. Most of you already are. That's okay. Uh, we're glad that you are here. Glad that you are uh, present this morning. And let me just get this out of the way right now. Everybody who was somebody lost last night. So that's all right. We all lost together. All right. So go ahead and laugh all you want. If uh, the only teams that won, I think, are Louisiana Tech, go on mater, and LSU, and we don't care about LSU anyway. So forget that. Uh, I know some of you are looking forward to the new, the new shows that are coming. version that's coming out I think either this week or next week the old version with Scott Bakula who used to be NCIS, NCIS New Orleans I believe it was the director of that uh, well he was the very first quantum leapster so to speak and as we began watching that show just this last week we watched one concerning Waco the Waco baseball team versus Colleen baseball team. I'm going, well, this is here local. This is Central Texas. This is right here where we are. And they showed another one. We watched two or three in a row. Binge watched, I guess you could say. And then we watched one where the lady looked at Scott Bakula and said, I think you've got a brain tumor. I said, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> That's enough. That's a little close to home. That's an, I don't know, it's an old show that's coming out with a new show, but let's move on to something different. Uh, we know that many of you, different wise, this week have known about Queen Elizabeth II and how she passed on to glory, so to speak. So I want to remember her after these attacks that occurred on 9-11, of which I know that you know where you were during those attacks. If you remember, if you were around, if you were born on that day or before that day, I know that you remember where you were. I was in an office complex as a student minister with a television on the wall. And I remember seeing the, the twin towers being engulfed in flames and watching calling my associate pastor to come watch on television as it was unfolding. So we have a special video memory of 9-11 attacks that we want to show for you right now, I want to, along with a few pictures. On September 11th, 2001, the course of American history was suddenly changed. We remember the chaos and the confusion, the destruction and the heartbreak, the shock of 3,000 lives. stood in the gap, somehow still fighting, giving every ounce of strength to help others. Decades have passed since that historic day, and in that time, we have learned that despite all the suffering and loss, our God remains faithful. Even when smoke and debris obscure our paths, his unfailing love will carry us through. As we remember those who were lost, let us honor their memory with our lives, giving our own strength to help the hurting, making sacrifices for those around us, and sharing the faith which brings eternal hope and peace. This is our promise and our prayer for 9-11. As you go through the day today, I want you to remember 3,000 people 21 years ago 
got up thinking today was going to be just as normal. And it wasn't as normal for them. Almost 3,000. That's a lot of people. So let's remember today. We don't want to... that after the September 11th terror attacks, many expected the houses of worship to be jammed with spectators, be jammed with parishioners seeking refuge, parishioners seeking community, a place to grieve. And that spike in church attendance did, in fact, occur briefly. But the attacks did not have a lasting effect on American religiosity. People thought this type of crisis of national significance would lead people to be more religious, and it did, but it was very short-lived. There's a blip in church attendance, and then things went back to what we call normal, normalcy. In just a couple of weeks, it went back to normal. And though church attendance spiked briefly, after 9-11, America's overall participation in religious activities was actually in decline at the time. A trend slow enough not to be identified until recently. The best data point to a slow, steady drop in religious attendance and religious engagement until afterwards, after they could smell the burning buildings and the posters asking for help. One of those places was by in actual New York City where the bombings took place. And primarily, Redeemer Presbyterian Church stretched out the door quite So you could still see a few days later the burnings of the buildings. You could still hear. You could hear the noise. You could smell what was fragrance in the air. Four days later, you would think church attendance at, at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, normally about 2,800, would spike. And indeed it did, 5,300 for two weeks. And it was back to normal. What does that tell us about our American, where we should be as a nation when it comes to God? What does that tell us about you? What does that tell us about me? I, I can tell you what it tells about me. It tells me that I don't perhaps know enough of the Scripture passage you heard this morning, enough of the Scriptures that we read about. Uh, if you want to uh, take your Bibles and open to John chapter 11, you can keep your finger right there because we'll come back to that. In just a minute, but John chapter 11 uh, speaks about one of the verses we most often joke about, and I don't want us to joke about it this morning. I want us to, uh, to think about what Scripture passages really mean a lot to us. So, Bible going, oh no, oh no, well, I got to got to find a spot. Let me, let, me, let me find these 18 verses and I'll read them. Oh, I don't need you to do that. I need you to come up with something that's in your heart, that's in your mind, that's in your, your heart of hearts to begin with. And perhaps you don't have it quite all right together. But perhaps you do. Perhaps let's start with an easy one. Let's start with John chapter 3 verse what? All right, let's start with that one. What's, someone start that off, and the rest of you chime in. That he gave, that whosoever. All right, so most of you know that. All right, what is another one that you know? And you can blurt it out all you want. Surely you know more than one. Come on, blurt it out. 
This is audience participation. Uh, there we go, somebody. Okay. Someone else. Those are good. John 3.16 is good. What's another one that you know? We saw some get baptized this morning. One of the reasons. in the knowledge of who the Savior actually is, Jesus Christ, so that they will begin to live like Him, love like Him, and be like Him. And how can we be like someone unless, unless we honor them with their words? So what are the words of Jesus? Come on, I know that you all know them. All right. There we go. There we go. I love that, Miss Mary. All right, someone else. Someone speak it loud enough for I, for everybody to hear. There we go. Okay. The world might be saved through him. We read John three sixteen quite often. John 3, 17, we sometimes leave behind. We sometimes leave it. It's like uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We commonly memorize Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, but we forget 1 through 4, which sets up 3, 5, and 6. So I want to encourage you to take some of God's Word. And this morning, our goal is to look at the shortest verse in the Bible. The shortest verse in the Bible which we usually make fun of. Which we usually, oh, I know that one. What is it? Jesus wept. That's right. That's the shortest verse in the Bible. We can remember Jesus wept. But do you know why He wept? Do you know the home passage? The home verse? The home address of Jesus wept. What is it? John chapter 11. We already know that. What is Jesus wept? John chapter 11. Verse 35. That's right. Verse 35. Say that with me. Can you say that? Those two words? Can you say those two words with me? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Say it again. One, two, three. Jesus wept. Now say the home verse with me. John 11, 35. Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? On the back of your bulletin, you'll find three pages, three pages of notes <clears throat> that actually three different parts of the notes, the tears of Jesus, the tears of others, and the way, the truth, and the life. The resurrection, in other words, the thing that we often forget about when we say John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me through Jesus Christ, says the Son. All right? John 14, 6, we understand that. But what about the tears of Jesus. So let's begin with the tears of Jesus. What do we learn from them? When Jesus teaches or reaches Mary, she asks him a major theological question. Lord, why weren't you here? You could have stopped this. Now we say often, Jesus wept. Oh, that's the, the shortest verse in the Bible. Surely I can memorize that. Well, if we can, why haven't we? Why haven't we taken John eleven thirty five and put it to our heart, put it to our memory, put it to reasons why it is even in the Scripture, figuring out why it is that Jesus indeed 
and what that figures to mean for each one of us. She asked him a question, but he couldn't even speak. The tears of Jesus. All I could do was weep. The scripture says that. <clears throat> As you read the story, you know what it is. In verse 4, Jesus heard it, and he said, John chapter 11, verse 4, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness, talking about Lazarus, does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Mary and their brother Lazarus. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? And a little bit later on, after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I go to wake him up. The disciples said, Don't worry about it, Lord. If he's fallen asleep, we'll wake him up. When we get there, we'll wake him up. And Jesus told them plainly, since you guys don't get it, Lazarus has died. And they looked at him with this blank stare on their face. What do you mean he's dead? We thought you just said he has fallen asleep. Yeah, he's died. So I tell you what, let's stay here two more days. What, well, two more days? Uh, Lazarus is dead? Let's stay here two more days. Yeah, that, that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to stay here two more days. Because there's ministry to be done here for two more days. Before I go see my companion, Lazarus. Now, can you imagine what Jesus must have felt like? Can you imagine Jesus knowing what he was going to do? Knowing that he was going to bring honor and glory to himself through the raising of the dead of Lazarus. And his disciples are standing there going, we don't understand. I don't think I would have understood either. I think had I been like one of the disciples, I would have been just like one of the disciples. Not knowing, not understanding even though I had seen what Jesus had done, even though I had known what Jesus was capable of doing, I did not know what he would do. For your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So he was in the tomb, verse 17. He found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Verse 21 Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know you ask from God. Your brother Lazarus. Yeah, my friend Lazarus. It's going to rise again. Yeah, Right. Yeah, had you been here, you could have prevented this from happening, Martha said. Which later on, Mary said the same thing. So Jesus said to her, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called Mary, saying to her in private, Teacher, the teacher is here and is calling for you. So that catches us up to where we are. The tears of Jesus. What did they have to do when Jesus saw what was with her in the house and Mary that had come, when Mary came in verse 32 to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, I, yeah, I know you've heard that before. Lord, if you'd been here, I, I know Jesus has heard that before. Lord, if you'd have been here, oh, if you'd have just been here, look at where Lazarus would be today. But it's four days later. He's still in the tomb. Lord, if you had just been here. If you had just been here. 
And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. This is a part that's difficult. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. So when Jesus saw the tears of others, he had tears for himself, yes. He did not have tears against Lazarus. He did not have tears against Mary and Martha. He did not have tears against the Jews. He had tears against death itself. Because he knew death had seemingly, seemingly to those that were around him, Mary, Martha, and the other Jews, had seemingly won. And so he cried. Oh, he didn't just cry. The Scripture, in fact, says he was greatly moved. He was moved to the point that his facial expressions changed. His, his persona changed. In fact, when he wept so loud, he wept not for himself, but he wept for others to be able to hear him. Jesus wept. John 11.35 Jesus wept. So we look at 34, and He said, Where have you laid Him? They said to Him, Lord, come and see. And verse 35 very simply says, Jesus wept. And the Jews, so the Jews said, oh, See how He loved Him. But some of them said, Could not He open the eyes of the blind man? have also kept this man from dying. Then Jesus deeply moved again. Deeply moved. In other words, Jesus didn't just weep loudly. It wasn't just His tears that He was shedding. It wasn't just tears for the others that He was shedding. It was, I'm greatly moved. In fact, the Bible puts it in a manner it's a little bit like an animal. That he responded with guttural movements of his mouth and guttural sounds that emitted from his body. He was greatly moved because his friend, his companion, had died. So John eleven thirty five, The shortest verse in the Bible. The one that should speak volumes to us. It doesn't. Oh, we know John 3.16. We can even know John 3.17. We can even know Romans 1.16. We can even know Genesis 1.1. We can even know John 1.1. We can know John 14.6. We can know all these Scripture passages. And yet we laugh and joke about the shortest one in the Bible. Jesus wept. It has more meaning in those two words than any two words we could find in the New Testament or the Old Testament. Jesus wept. Jesus showed who he was. Jesus showed his emotions. Jesus showed that he actually loved someone. Oh, do we love like that today? I'm sure we do. I'm sure we do. How many of you men have, have taken your wives out by themselves lately and showed them that you love them? All right, raise your hands. Uh, some of you ever want to raise them? Some of you do not. All right, some of you are going, whoop, 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 uh, uh, kind of quickly like that. All right. How many of you wives have taken your husbands out and shown them you love them? All right. Let's do equal opportunity employment right there, right, right now. All right, so we, we have that both of the times. We have that to where sometimes we show love and sometimes we don't show. Sometimes we expect love. No. We expect, oh, so-and-so. I, I know they love me. They, they know I love them. 
I'm not going to say anything more to them. Jesus had tears of compassion. He had tears for himself. He had tears for others. Weren't you there? You could have stopped this. So he goes on to say, as the Bible says, love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how much we are to love one another. The Bible says that. Don't you think that Jesus would have known when he said to Martha, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man, no man comes to the Father but by, by me. Don't you think he would have known that Martha would have known how much he actually loved the brother, Lazarus? So he goes to them and he says, okay, let's, let's handle this. So let's go to, to John uh, 11 chapter, uh, let's go to verse 40. He is moved again. He came to the tomb. He said, take away the stone. Mary the Martha, Martha the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. For he has been in there four days. <laughs> and Jesus said to her, did I not tell you? If you believed, you would see the glory of God. Did, didn't I already say that? Did I tell you, Martha, that you would see the glory of God happen before your eyes? What part of that do you not believe? What part of that do you not believe? What part of that do I not believe? What part of that do we corporately believe or disbelieve? Verse 41. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father. Oh, the first thing he did was pray. Let's take the stone away. Okay, let me call Lazarus. No. The first thing he did was pray. The first thing he did was say, Father. I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Come out. Lazarus, come out. Now, he had been there four days. We believe what Martha had said. He'd been there long enough that he should be smelling by now. All right, when I was in the baptistry this morning, it was funny, Gunner. I'm going to pick on you just a little while. I went to grab Gunner's nostrils so that he wouldn't have the water go up his nose, and Gunner shook his head like that a, kind of, a little bit. And, and so, what I tell students is, as well as what Thomas tells students, is if you're worried about water going up your nose, you can grab your own nostril like that. All right, you can do that, or you can have the person that's being the baptizer grab your nostrils and lean you down in the water and pull you back up. That way you won't get water in it. Can you imagine the odor that must have been present? And yet Jesus wasn't worried about the odor. He said, it doesn't matter, Martha. What matters is that God the Father hears what I'm saying to him. And I know he does. Verse 42, I knew that you always hear me. I said this on account of the people standing around. I know that you always hear me, Father. But I prayed publicly so that the people would hear what I had to say to you privately. Have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed publicly so that those might hear you? Pri oh, I, I can't pray publicly. Frank, you just don't understand. Yes, you can. If you can talk, if you can talk, you can pray publicly. Now, some will say, if you can sing, you can sing. If you can talk, you can sing. I, 
I beg differ with that because some of you, I've heard some of you sing. And some of you don't sound too good, all right? Singing, it's not quite like it normally is. But if you can talk normally, you can pray publicly. Sometimes our prayers are intended for the Father. And sometimes they're intended so that others might hear that we're actually praying. The man who had died came out. So we wrap this up. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him. Unbind him. Let him go. In other words, he didn't say anything about the stench. He didn't say anything about the odor. He didn't say anything about the fact that he'd been in the tomb for four days, and I'm sure he had been stinking to high heaven by then. He just simply said, I'm bound to you. Can, can you imagine what Lazarus must have been, felt like? I've been dead four days. Oh, gee willigers, I'm alive now. <laughs> can you imagine that? Can you imagine it? Can you imagine Lazarus going, <laughs> I can't imagine that. I can't imagine Lazarus being worried about what he smelled like. I can imagine Lazarus looking at Jesus saying, the way, the truth, the life has resurrected me from the grave, has resurrected me from the dead. Yes. Jesus cared enough to weep for me. He cared enough to weep loudly for me. He cared enough to be deeply moved in his spirit because of me, Lazarus. I was just his buddy. I was just his friend. And Jesus cared about him. The question is, do you know if Jesus cares about you? Perhaps you're much like Lazarus, and you think, hmm, that's a little bit like Job. All of Job's buddies wanted to say, Job, you've done something wrong. You've lost your family. You've lost your livestock. You've lost your money. You've lost everything. So, Job, what have you done wrong? Well, Lazarus, what have you done wrong? You died. What did you do wrong? What did you do? What have you done wrong? What have I done wrong? God treats all of us the same. We don't know why it is what happens to us. We don't need to know. We just need to hear the words of Jesus when he said, Martha, Mary, did you not hear this? Haven't I already told you this before? Don't you recognize that for me to suffer, you draw closer to who I am as you indeed suffer like I will suffer. In fact, I will not be like Lazarus. I will be like, hmm, because of Lazarus. Because of Lazarus? Because of Lazarus. Let's turn to the same chapter. Same chapter. Verse 53. So from that day on, the day that Lazarus was raised from the dead, from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. That's what they did with Jesus. They made plans, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the other Jews that were there. From the day that Jesus raised Lazarus, Jesus wept the shortest 
verse in the Bible. Two words. Why can't we remember John 11:35? Why can't we remember what it actually means to us? Jesus wept. And he'll weep for me. And he'll weep for others because of his love. First Peter 2.21 says, For this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. We are to suffer for Jesus Christ. We are to have that happen to us at the end of Lord of the Rings and I close with this The Hobbit Sam and you know that as well as I do that on part of the newness of the channels the Lord of the Rings is one of the things that J.R. Tolkien uh, utilized as a manner in which we might know the Lord closer more and more and at the end of the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit Sam, who thought everything was going wrong, wakes up, the sun is out. He sees Gandalf, the great wizard. And to me, this is a quintessence of Jesus. Because Sam, the Hobbit, sees Gandalf. He says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? <laughs> the answer of Jesus is, Everything sad that you know of, that you're aware of, is going to come untrue. And someday, that great morning, not M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, that great M-O-R-N-I-N-G, that great morning, the great morning won't just console us. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Is what Jesus asked Mary and Martha. No grace. No glory. You see, I did this for the glory of God. I didn't do it for my own glory. I did it so that I, in turn, could give the glory to God. I pray that today, that as you learn John eleven thirty five, 35, say it with me. Jesus wept. Say it again. Jesus wept. Say Say the home verse, John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. I pray that that verse comes alive to you. I pray that that verse has a meaning for you that is more meaningful than it ever has been before because Jesus carried with that verse a lot of meaning from that day forward. From the day he raised Lazarus, from the day Jesus wept, there were those that sought to put him to death. From that day. Not out of the day. From that day forward. I pray that God brings to your mind how much he truly loves you. As you saw evidenced in the baptisms this morning as you'll see evidence of next week even in our baptisms and perhaps the week after for sure next week I pray that you perhaps see young lives that are new young lives born again raised to walk in the newness of life that they would become like little Jesus walking the face of the earth let's pray God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you so much that Jesus, even though Mary and Martha were quite different, even though they had the same questions, they received the same answer. They received the fact that Jesus cared for their brother. They received the fact that Jesus is the way that no man comes to the Father. The truth that no man comes. The knowledge of who Jesus is, that he is the life, he is the resurrection, he is the one who gives us life. No man comes to the Father 
but by him. Lord, I pray that we can take to heart John eleven thirty five. Jesus indeed wept. It's in his name that we pray. If there's anyone that is here in the presence this morning and you need you need Jesus that's what I'm here for I'll be here after the service I'll be here after a little while if you need to come down and see us the microphone will be off please come down and see us let's listen to this song for just a minute